So this morning uh, I want to talk about a five million dollar violin, the psychology of sex, and the fascinating predictions of a secretive doomsday cult. But before I do any of that, I need to tell you about Maria Farnham. Maria Farnham was a passionate anti-feminist who in 1947 wrote an influential book entitled Modern Women, The Lost Sex, in which she argued that women can only find happiness in a domestic context because if they pursue a career, it will significantly reduce their ability to experience sexual enjoyment. Surprisingly, this book became an overnight bestseller and quite literally shaped the attitudes of post-war America. Consequently, this sort of image became indicative of the period. The message being, a woman's place is in the home. Because in the home she can experience happiness and fulfilment. Outside of the home, she cannot. Following the success of her book, Maria Farnham spent the 1950s earning a fortune traveling around America giving lectures. As far as we know, at no point did she ever grasp the irony that she made a career <laughs> telling women not to have a career. And we might ask ourselves the question, how on earth did she live with herself? How did she sleep at night being such a hypocrite? And the answer is exactly the same way that we all do. Over the next few weeks, we're going to learn about the fictions that we create that absolve ourselves of responsibility. Fictions that enable us to maintain our belief that we are smart, moral, and right. And that allow us to conveniently overlook the fact that we are actually dumb, <laughs> immoral, and stupid. In the book of Samuel, the Bible tells a bad story about a good man. As you know, David is one of the Bible's great characters. By any measure, he lived by a good set of morals. By any standard, his faith was genuine and absolutely sincere. But his story is interesting because, like our own, it is complex. And so despite his overall goodness, in this morning's episode, he manages to break, I think, five of the Bible's Ten Commandments. So that's pretty good, really. <laughs> so in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we're told that it's the spring, and it's the time when the kings go off to war. So in the ancient world, the business of warfare is a bit like sport, insofar as it's seasonal. So there's a winter and stay at home with your buddy season, and then there's a, ooh, it's April, we better go to war season. So in this story, it's spring. It's the time of the year when the kings go off to war. However, you'll notice that this particular king does not go off to war. His army goes to war, but he stays in Jerusalem. So basically, he's taking a sick day, but he's not actually sick. Uh, perhaps it's a mental health day, something like that. Um, then in the next sentence, we're told that one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. And what jumps out at me in this sentence is the time of day. You're getting out of bed in the evening. What does this tell you about this person's state of mind? He's depressed. He's, he's certainly emotionally low at this point. Perhaps bored, perhaps all of those things at once. The story so far is that David is at the pinnacle of his career. He's won every battle he's ever fought. He's built a city that's rapidly becoming the envy of the ancient Near East. He's written large parts of the Bible, and you can tell from those parts of the Bible that he actually loves his faith. He's serious about it. He's genuine about it. This guy, by any measure, has lived an amazing life. He's the toast of the town, the poster boy of the ancient Near East. And yet, at a time when he's supposed to be off having an adventure, doing manly things like poring over maps and divisional placements and topography in some forward command tent, 
He's at home having a mental health day, staying in his bed till the late afternoon. Why? Maybe this is a middle age thing, I don't know. Maybe he's bored of doing the things that he's successfully done for so many years. That can happen, right? Many of you, perhaps all of you know what that's like. Ooh, I closed another deal today. Awesome. <laughs> Cleaned my house, baked. 20 years ago, I loved this stuff. Now, it doesn't do it for me the way it used to. Could be middle age, I don't know. The, the optimism of youth gone and just the indignities and the embarrassments of old age to come. Maybe that's it, that can happen. Maybe, as you said, he is depressed. Certainly sounds like he's depressed, doesn't it? Don't want to get up today. Don't want to go to work today. Think I'll just stay in bed. And it's at those times in our lives, times when we're bored, times when we're emotionally low, times when we're depressed, <coughs> that we create the most convincing fictions in our own heads. And those fictions very quickly become our own worst enemy. So David, whom we are assuming is bored and depressed, gets out of bed in the evening. He wanders around the roof of his palace. This is a get up at lunchtime, pour yourself a bowl of Cheerios and see what's on TV kind of deal. The story goes on. From his rooftop in his boredom, he sees a woman bathing. And the text is careful to tell us that the woman was very beautiful. Um, so, so he sees a woman taking a bath on her roof. Uh, just a little bit of, of, of detail here. Uh, this was and still is in some parts of the world a perfectly normal thing to do. So you would store water on your rooftop, allow that water to get warmed in the heat of the Mediterranean sun. And then in the evening, when you were hot and sticky from your day's labours, you would take a bath, cool off, and that would guarantee a good night's sleep uh, in the evening. So David, he's bored at home, doesn't have a TV, doesn't have Cheerios, but what he does have is way better. He's got the highest rooftop in the city. So in a moment of pure perversion, he says, I think I'll go and see which of my neighbours are having a bath. <laughs> yeah, it's awkward. And um, so he sees this attractive woman, and in a singular moment, a lot of things combine in his head to create a very convincing fiction. He sees a beautiful woman. He's depressed. He needs a pick-me-up. He's bored. You see where this fiction is going. He convinces himself that this is what he needs right now. But rather than taking a step back from this fiction, he begins to indulge it. He begins to think about what it would be like. He begins to fantasize about her. And all of the good sense that has taken him to this point in his life is temporarily shelved in favor of this most convincing Fiction, and he then makes moves he will later regret. So in the next sentence, we read that David, this is David the good man. This is David the man who has made a career out of making good choices, who has made a morality out of doing good things. This guy sleeps with her and she goes back home. And notice how perfunctory and mechanical the verbs are in this sentence. He sends for her, he sleeps with her, she goes back home. It's perfect, isn't it? Check into the motel, sleep with her, each go our separate ways. It's, it's that mechanical, it's that perfunctory. And, and I don't even feel bad about it, to be honest, and we know he doesn't. Uh, end of story. Then a few weeks later, however, the woman, I guess she gets a home pregnancy test or something. And uh, she texts David and says, hey, bad news, I'm pregnant. And my husband is a soldier on deployment in your army. How are we going to explain this? Because you're the baby daddy. I know young phrases like that. I'm in social media, you wouldn't understand. Um, <laughs> What are we going to do? So, right, okay. 
You know that story. But this is the point in the story where you are meant to say, my golly, I've been an idiot. This is the point in the story where you're meant to say, how stupid could I be? And then make moves accordingly. But David cannot do this. He is a good, good man who has just done a bad, bad thing. And what he has just done has created an irresolvable tension in his head. Your shrink calls this cognitive dissonance. This is the state of tension that exists when you are forced to hold two inconsistent truths or ideas in your own head. And the only way of resolving them is either to own up and say you're an idiot, which sometimes makes the tension worse, or by justifying your own behavior by digging deeper in your own fiction. Let me explain. Do you ever... I'm not going to ask the question as though it's never happened. I'll, I'll just state it as a fact. How many times in your life have you bought something that was just stupid? Right? Like, let's say you bought a TV. One of the big, good ones. And in a corner of your brain, you know that buying that TV made you a complete idiot. Because here are the facts. You're already broke. You already watch too much television. And your old television works perfectly fine. Therefore, buying a new television makes you an idiot. So here you have these two tensions in your head. These tensions must be resolved. You can either take the new television back and say to the storekeeper, excuse me, Mr. Storekeeper, it turns out I'm an idiot. Can I put this back? Not going to happen. So instead, you dig deeper into your own fiction and you justify what you did. So you create this story. Well, the television was a bargain. It was on sale. And you know, you work so hard during the week and a television helps you relax. And, and, and when the Raptors get into the playoffs, you can invite your friends around and after the game, you can invite them to church. Now it's an evangelistic tool. <laughs> And the more expensive the television, the more elaborate your fiction is and the deeper it becomes. In 1958, students at Stanford University were invited to attend a class on the psychology of sex. Now, what student would not want to attend a class on the psychology of sex? However, the, the class was selective. So, before students were allowed to attend the class, they had to fulfill certain admission criteria. For some students, the criteria was very gentle. So, they were asked to fill in a form, name, address, phone number, and a short sentence on why they would like to attend the class. No big deal. However, other students were asked to perform a kind of drama. So, they had to stand in a public place within the university and read aloud lurid passages from Lady Chatterley's lover. Which in conservative 1950s America was an excruciatingly embarrassing thing to have to do. So anyway, they all did that. And then the students who fulfilled the entrance cr criteria were admitted to the class. Now, when they got there, the class, by all accounts, was completely boring. <clears throat> What the university did was they got the most boring lecturers with the least amount of personality to give a talk on the mating habits of birds. <laughs> then they, 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 they spoke to the students afterwards, and here's what they discovered. The students who got into the class quite cheaply by filling in a form were unanimous in saying this class was a complete waste of time. They were furious about it. It was annoying. It was useless. How dare you waste our time like this? However, the students who had to jump through embarrassing hoops in order to be allowed to attend the class raved about how amazing it was. 
It's the best thing that ever happened to them. It was life changing, in fact. The more you pay, the more you have to justify what you paid. It seems that if you get knocked on the head on the way to church, it won't make you enjoy church anymore. But if getting knocked on the head is a prerequisite for being allowed to get into church, you love every minute of it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying we're going to do that. But. <laughs> and you'll have to love every minute of it. Because that's your brain's way of justifying how stupid you were for allowing yourself to get knocked on the head to attend church. So here you have David. Good man. Religious leader, very serious person who does the right thing all the time, who's just done a bad thing. The tension in his head is unbearable. He can either own up, or he can dig deeper in his own fiction. And that's never a contest. So he digs deeper. So he sends word to Joab, his general, Send me Uriah the Hittite. Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, how the war is going, yada, yada, yada. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Now, notice please that the story is very careful to be a little bit racist at this point. So he's not just Uriah, he's Uriah the Hittite. Hittites were not Jews. So here we are being given very low expectations of this person. He's not like David. He doesn't have a long track record of moral success. He's probably not going to do the right thing. So this should be easy. David says to him, go down and wash your feet. Uh, feet in the Bible. Uh, sometimes the word feet refers to the two things that you stand upon. And on other occasions it refers to a certain part of the male anatomy. This is, this is one of those occasions. So you understand what David is saying here, euphemistically. He's saying, I'd like you to go home and sleep with your wife. And the reason I need you to do that, doesn't tell him this, but I need you to cover up the fact that I am your wife's baby daddy. That's what I need. <coughs> Dig deeper in the fiction. So Uriah left the palace. A gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all the other servants and did not go to his own home. David was told, Uriah did not go home. So he asked him, why haven't, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the Ark of the Covenant and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my own house and eat and drink? And make love to my wife. Surely as you live I will not do such a thing. Ouch. <laughs> so here you have the quasi pagan Hittite. Showing a better morality than the king of God's people. Again this is the point where David as a good person should say. Yeah, I, yeah I'm an idiot. How? I'm bad. I did a bad thing. I need to own up. I need to confess this. Do I do that? Or do I take the dig deeper door? Keep digging. <laughs> David says to him, Stay one more day and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him. David made him drunk. Amazing. In the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. Do you see what the Bible writer is saying here? He's saying the pagan has a better morality drunk <laughs> than the king of God's people has sober. So now, like, come, come on. Now the game is up. <coughs> like you've dug and you've dug and you've dug. You've indulged this fiction. You've... You've made it worse and worse and worse. And now you are presented with the facts. This fiction is not going to work. Now you have to own up. Right? You. Okay, let's not talk about David. Let's talk about you. Only for a second though, I promise. You would think, wouldn't you? 
that if I presented you with the facts about a situation, facts that proved you were wrong and stupid and immoral, you would, upon receiving those facts, say, oh my golly, you're right. I should go and change my ways. <coughs> Not a chance. We always find a way of staying stupid. We're awesome at it. We always find a way of ignoring facts that prove how stupid we are. So imagine that you're a world-class violinist and your prized possession is a $5 million, 300-year-old Stradivarius. And to you, the warmth, the curves, the tone of the thing is amazing. You dropped five million bucks on it, but it's worth every penny because it is, it is, it makes a sound like no other. And then some music engineer, scientist, geek from, a, from Sony comes to you and says, you know what? For $50,000, you can buy a modern guitar, uh, violin that outperforms the Stradivarius in every single aspect. And you don't just say that, you set up tests, blind tests, tests that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the $50,000 state-of-the-art modern violin is vastly superior to the 300-year-old $5 million Stradivarius. Do you think you would say, wow, I'm going to flip my Stradivarius and make myself $4,950,000 and play better music. No. The director of the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra, who owns a $5 million Stradivarius, actually said this. I don't know a single soloist who would trade his Stradivarius, not even for a profit of $4,950,000. You'll be rich and better. But when you've spent five million dollars on anything, you need to justify it. And the more you spend, the more you're into it, the deeper your justification must become. When I did a course at the Vatican a few years ago, uh, a few of the, my fellow students obviously were, were Italian priests. And uh, a few of them were talking about how they believed in Italy at the time there was, a, there was a satanic conspiracy in society where members of satanic cults were abusing children and eating babies. They actually believed this. And because we'd gone through things like this in Britain many years earlier and in North America, also, I felt quite confident in saying to, to my fellow students on the course, actually, there's no evidence of this. That thing you're saying there is no evidence of this whatsoever. And that's a fact. <clears throat> when I presented them with that fact, they all said, well, of course there's no evidence. That just proves how clever the ways of darkness are. <laughs> I can't change my mind. I need to dig deeper. When in World War II, uh, the Americans, now quite shamefully, I think it's, it's, it's regarded as being shameful anyway, uh, made the decision to intern Japanese Americans. Um, they did so on the basis of rumors that Japanese Americans were planning to sabotage the war effort. There was no proof of this at the time. None. The Western commander of the US forces, General DeWitt, admitted that the military had no evidence whatsoever against a single Japanese American. No evidence that a single one was planning to sabotage the war effort. And then he said this, the very fact that no sabotage has taken place is a disturbing indication that such action will be taken. You can't win with these people. You will always... Now, you know I'm not talking about violins 
and internment camps and satanic cults. I'm talking about you and me. You will always find a way of pulling the wool over your own eyes. You will always find a way of justifying decisions that make your life worse, not better. And the stupider it is, the more elaborate your justifications will become. We all do this. Next sentence. In the morning then, David wrote a letter to Joab, sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So what you find in this story, just like in life, just like in yours, just like in mine, is an ever-increasing commitment to increasingly stupid behavior. <coughs> this is the lost money fallacy that Las Vegas has built upon. Right now in Las Vegas, some intelligent person is saying, I just lost 20 bucks on blackjack. Do I A, walk away from the table, or B, double down and drop another 40? Just lost 40, need to double down, need to keep going, because that justifies how stupid I've been. It's fascinating and funny to me anyway, to read end of the world predictions that come from doomsday cults, Christian or otherwise. And what's amazing to me is that when these predictions fail, as they inevitably do, and the world does not end as foreseen, absolutely no one ever, ever says, I was wrong. You should probably never listen to me ever again. Turns out, I don't have a clue. No one ever says this. In fact, the opposite always happens. Whenever the leader of a doomsday or a Christian or some end of the world cult gives a failed prediction, the moment their failure becomes obvious, they become even more convinced of their powers of prediction. Doesn't make any sense. So in 1954, an alien abduction cult, and if you're going to belong to a cult, that's probably a good one to go with, <laughs> um, called, it's called Miss Keach, Marion Keach, said that the world would end on December the 24th of that year. Christmas Eve! <laughs> and uh, Miss Keach had a prophecy. She said that the faithful members of her cult would be rescued on December the 20th, midnight December the 20th. A spaceship would land in her garden <laughs> in suburbia and take fa her faithful believers off to safety. Um, so here you have a very specific prediction, don't you? The world will end on Christmas Eve, four days earlier, we believers will be saved at midnight by a spaceship. So, in response to this very specific and gloomy prediction, her followers did what these followers of these cults <coughs> always do. They sold their homes. They quit their jobs. They liquidized their assets. Who needs money in outer space? <laughs> and on December the 20th, they gathered in Miss Keach's front room to pray and await the arrival of the little green men. When midnight came and went, the group apparently became increasingly nervous. We know this because it was infiltrated by a psychologist. One o'clock came, two o'clock came, three o'clock came, four o'clock came. People were frantic. They sold their homes for this. No spaceship. By 4.45 a.m., <clears throat> Miss Keach received a new vision, a new word. It turns out that because of the faithfulness of her little group, the world had been spared. Oh. <laughs> now, you say awe. Oh. <clears throat> you say what a shame. And the reason you say that is because you didn't sell your home. You didn't quit your job. 
you weren't part of this particular stupidity. If you were, you would have done what they had done. What do you think they did? Right, there you were, right? You just sold your home, you quit your job, you gave up everything. This is the point, surely, where you say, oh, gee whiz, turns out I'm an idiot. I just sold everything to follow a crazy woman. You think that's what they did? No. They became even more convinced about their beliefs. Now, now they saw it as their role in life to evangelize the world and tell everyone how right they were to believe the aliens were going to save them from the destruction of Earth. As soon as she gave her alternative message at 4.45 a.m., the mood in this group turned from gloom to euphoria. They became even more convinced believers of this stupid, stupid woman. They doubled down. They had to. Because the alternative meant admitting their stupidity. Now, it's fun, I think, to talk about wacky end-of-the-world cults and hypocritical anti-feminists. It's a no-brainer to talk about what you would do if you had a five million dollar Stradivarius. The mistakes that these people made are easy to see. And so are the shortcomings of other people, even the people sitting next to you. Uh, part of the reason why I love talking about you so much <laughs> is because I can very become an e quickly become an expert in you. <laughs> Give me five minutes listening to your situation and I'll become a PhD in you. I'll be able to point out exactly what your mistakes are and exactly what you need to do to fix them and offer some pretty useful suggestions on how you can move your life to the next level into a better place. I'm good like that. But when it comes to me, I can be as blind as a bat, dumb as an ox. And you're that way too. We all go to extraordinary lengths to avoid looking at ourselves and saying, I'm a bit of an idiot, actually. But we shouldn't. Because the second we own our own stupidity is the second we take a step towards our own healing. Now, don't get me wrong, from a certain point of view, self-justification is a good thing. It, without self justification, we torture ourselves at the road not taken, or of how badly we navigated the road actually taken. We'd be in agony, we wouldn't sleep at night, so we need to justify our own behaviour. But too much self-justification can leave us stuck and blind to solutions that might make our lives so very much better. Now this matters to us as Christians for two reasons. Reason number one. A key part of our Christian life is repentance. This is healthy, this is necessary, and this is biblical. The word repentance in the Bible literally means to turn around. Keep going the stupid way I'm going, or stop and turn around. And the Bible asks us to be constantly thinking about the things that we need to stop doing and turn away from and repent. And quite obviously, you can't repent without knowing what it is you should probably be repenting of. And the blinder you insist on staying, the less you'll see. The second reason why this matters is because the thing that holds you back most effectively in life is not your situation or your competition or some conflict you're having with your mother's auntie's cousin on your husband's side or any of that nonsense. All of that's just a smokescreen and an excuse. The thing that holds you back most effectively in your life is the thoughts that are in your own head too easily and unthinkingly, you allow yourself to become your own worst enemy. And you can't fix what's broken until you admit it's broken. You can't
can't mend what needs mending until you become brave enough to say, this needs mending. This isn't working anymore. This isn't working the way it should. This life, this career, this health, this relationship, this, I'm, I can't stay blind anymore. I need to fix, I need to mend, I need to heal. And the first step is an uncomfortable one. It means doing what we almost never do. I am stupid. I am dumb. And I'm actually quite immoral. Do we have time for questions? I hope not. <laughs> we don't! Yes! <laughs> More on this next week. Thanks for coming. God bless you.